the giant. Before the storms had flooded the roots with enough nourishment for a hundred cycles of the moon, the place by the cave was littered with raspberries, with short hair and skyward pointing ears flanking two small velvet covered horns similar to the ossicones on a giraffe. Raspars resemble an oddly mutated goat. Their narrow, hollow heads perch on top of an almost lifeless body. To the creature living in the cave next to those protruding roots, these simple raspars are a source of food, the only sustaining food that creature has ever known. The presence of raspars had been a sign of comfort, a sign of assurance. Hunger in this land is a very real threat, and the creature had been lucky to have a steady income of raspars. Then the rain came, for what seemed like ages, driving the raspars away from the land near the cave. Food became scarce. The creature's hunger forces him to capture tiny insects and rats that scurry into his cave for shelter from the incessant water. Rats and bugs are no fit meal for something of creature size. He stands at a giant five meters head to foot. His large, gorilla-like forearms allow him to balance most of his massive weight on the front half of his body. His body so large and disproportionate that when he moves, it is a stalking crawl. Even in his hunger, he doesn't stray too far from the cave. What is past those rocks on the horizon is unknown. In our world, a creature might be intimidating, feared even. But there is no one left in Creature's world to fear him now, aside from his food. His isolation and loneliness have been with him so long, Creature can barely remember having known anyone else. Memories of his parents, his village, his long-gone companion all fade by the minute. Time is the thief of memory. The monotony of his solitary life used to be broken up by Rasbars wandering too close to his cave, but now even that is gone. When the storms came, the sun stopped rising and setting as it always had. Instead, now it never leaves. The sun rotates around, parallel to the land just above the horizon, shining through the permanent clouds and mist. The creature's world is now a perpetual dusk. Never wholly light or dark, just a constant grey. No longer did this world have bright yellow sunsets, vivid red birds or deeply green forests. The constant rain didn't nourish life in this place. It choked it, matted it, made it monotonous and ugly. This bleak grey place, combined with his oppressive loneliness, leaves Creature unable to describe how he feels anymore. He is as empty as this world, as empty as his stomach. The only thing that breaks the silence of his cave is the pattern of his own breathing. On one cold, misty dawn, he strains his ears at a small sound outside his cave. His breathing stops. Could it be a raspar? His mind exclaims, there haven't been any in months. What has made them come back? Creature inches closer to the opening, being as quiet as a mouse. One clenched fist resting on the ground after the other, inching, inching, inching. As he approaches the opening of the cave, his body is covered in shadow. Anyone with prying eyes would see only his faint silhouette because Creature is concealing his most distinguishing feature, his eyes. When he dares to lift his eyelids, his eyes' glowing whiteness pierce the area around his cave. These shining bulbs are hollow and intense, and when he opens them, he sees that finally, after all this time, is no longer alone. His eyelids flicker in disbelief. A mad 
matter on? I have never seen a matter on, only heard stories. The matter on looks just as they were described to him in the stories long ago. Slender bodied runners with long legs and a rounded head. These flat nosed animals are rare in this land. So rare that creature is only sure this is a matter on by the uniqueness of its horns. Three stalks in a triangle, twisting together to create a helix stretching upwards. It was said that Madarons are tempters of fate, Hunt Goods, the hand of God. God. Creature remembered his elders describing their sheer speed with awe. awe. Madarons were wildly believed in the old times, but as the storms kept coming, their believability waned. After all, if Madarons were agents of God, why would he punish this land, their home in such a way? This was a forsaken place. Creature slowly creeps forward with his glowing eyes fixed on the Madaron, which, while drinking from the pools outside the cave, is oblivious to his approach. Step by step, Creature comes closer and closer, inching, inching, inching. Suddenly, Creature steps down on a branch, giving a loud snap. The Madaron instinctively raises its head and locks eyes with the creature from the cave. Both of them frozen in time, evaluating their options. Without any warning, the Madaron dashes its whole body away from the creature, jetting down the riverbank at breakneck speed. Creature immediately follows. It is the hunger, the fear that there will never be another opportunity like this that drives Creature into this irrational pursuit. It is incredibly bad luck to kill the hand of God. He knows, but he doesn't care anymore. He is starving. His body won't let him say no to this meal. His feet and hands cross feverishly over and over, trying to keep pace with the Madaron. As Creature leaves the confines of his cave, his mind is a rush of freedom and fear. These contrasting emotions so intertwined he doesn't know where one ends and the other begins. The Madaron sprints down a series of narrow passageways enclosed by rock walls. Moving faster than he ever has before, Creature keeps his eyes locked on the Madarn's legs. Their legendary speed is true, Creature realizes. The mysterious Madarn is taunting him with its whimsical trotting, seemingly without a care in the world. Sharp turn after sharp turn, elegant and easy. The Madarn's body never once skims the cramped walls, while the Creature bumps and ricochets off each one. No real food for ages makes it hard to run this fast, and he is getting tired. Losing focus, Creature moves his eyes from their fixed spot on the Madaron's legs to the animal's head. Oddly, the Madaron is facing squarely back at Creature. How can running backwards be so easy? Creature wonders to himself. The Madaron is confident, knowing it will never be caught. caught. They continue for minutes on end, struggling through the tight space. As his intensity lessens, Creature begins to notice odd things around him. There are hundreds of other caves here. Each one filed neatly inside the giant rock walls, four meters apart from each other in an orderly pattern. Not natural, deliberate. Creature has been running past these cells, unaware, since he left his own. Suddenly the space opens up and they are free from the rocks, running through an open field of red wheat that thrashes at Creature's waist. The air above feels endless compared to the confined passageway. Straight ahead, Creature notices smoke coming from exactly where the Madon is leading him. Now, as they approach the field's edge, the smell stops Creature in his tracks. The scent is so repugnant that it nearly knocks him backwards. Creature stands just outside a large dirt patch that is surrounded by a structure he's not familiar with. The walls are tall and strong, but transparent enough to see through. Creature shifts his gaze and now sees that the Madaron is gone, vanished into thin air. Where it had once galloped, only light particles remained. 
Had he not been so lonely or so hungry, perhaps Creature could have sensed that he was walking further into a trap. But this is strange and surreal, and he has to know what lay beyond. As he moves closer, Creature can see in more detail now. Inside the transparent metal walls are hundreds of rasbars standing in long, long lines that snake around and around. They aren't moving, but he can tell they are alive. They look different to him, though. They are massive compared to the ones that once lived near Creature's cave, and these smell dreadful. Creature approaches the metal walls, staring through its holes for a better look at the rasbars. As he creeps around a corner, he's suddenly aligned with the Rasbar's faces. Shock and horror overtake him. They do not have the faces of Rasbar's. They have Creature's face. All of them. Hundreds of these Rasbar creature hybrids clutter the fenced-in space. Creature could barely articulate his feelings. He'd been alone for so long. Why are they here? Why aren't they moving? Are they sick? Question after question flooded Creature's mind, overfilling it, causing massive confusion and pain. He was paralyzed with shock until a sharp sting in his shoulder made him cry out. Spinning his head around, he saw a tall, strange, peach-skinned animal standing upright on two legs. It was draped in a fabric of vivid colors from head to toe, holding a giant fire stick pointed directly at Creature. The sight of it was both pretty and ugly. He did not know this being. Where had it come from? Why was it hurting him? Did this being intend to put Creature behind those metal walls? From the hill below, three more slowly emerged, yelling loudly in his direction. The commotion was nearly deafening. As one of the beings lifted his fire stick, Creature felt pain rip through his stomach, pain he had never felt before. It was like the hunger he felt in the cave, but so much sharper. Creature fell to the ground, clutching his stomach. He could hear faint screams from behind the walls, warning him. They knew the pain Creature was feeling, but they were too weak to save him. Creature was getting weaker by the moment, too. With every ounce of strength he could muster, Creature hoisted himself up and ran the opposite direction from the beings inflicting the pain. But his effort was wasted as he quickly realized there was nowhere to run. Surrounding the metal walls were only the tall rocks. The beings blocked his entrance to the field that could take him back home. Exhausted, he skirted the base of metal walls searching for a passageway. Anything, any opening would do. Suddenly, two more beings came through an opening, holding not fire sticks, long sticks of lightning. They watched creatures struggle amusedly as they circled into place around him, pointing their pain makers directly at his body. Poor creature's head jerked left and then right, eyes wide searching for something, anything, any place to hide. He had only two choices. choices. Go back the way he came into this hellish place past those horrible beings, or press further forward. Toward what? He wasn't sure. Sure, sure, sure. Creature paused to evaluate. The beings around him appeared cautious. Their arms were out wide and they were lurking. Creature knew if he was going to make it past them, it was now or never. Or never, never. never wasn't an option. As fast as he could, Creature dashed toward the opening guarded by two beings. Their yells were a blur as he felt them lunge to stop him. Creature's vision clouded as his body convulsed under the pain from their contact. In his rage, Creature slammed a being into the metal wall with all his strength. He felt hope for just a moment. He moved to run, but the other being leapt onto him and in one swift motion, 
stabbed creature deep in the chest with a metal shard. Time froze. Creature stared down at his chest as red liquid spilled from his wound. He didn't feel the pain, which surprised him. The being lifted the shard to try again, but Creature had snapped back to the moment. The fear and shock had made him angry, and his anger had made him strong. He pulled the being from his back and threw him into the wall with such force that a beam buckled under impact. He heard the captive hybrids come alive to cheer him on. Creature looked back towards the passageway leading to his old life. Dozens of more beings sprinted towards him, intent only on stopping him. Creature turned towards the unknown, and then he felt it. The wound in his chest burned fresh and ferociously. Dizziness took over. While collapsing to the ground, Creature saw something burn through his consciousness so vividly. Is it a memory? A vision? He can't tell. He saw one of the creatures sitting in his cave. She had a big stomach and a beautiful smile. He felt an overwhelming amount of kindness toward her. She glanced at him with her giant eyes, but her infectious eyes that he loved so much no longer glowed bright. Creature could feel his own eyes start to dull. He knew that he should feel fear, but seeing her face after all this time had given him comfort. He felt her lean close and whisper in his ear, It's time for you to go now. As suddenly as it came, the vision was gone. Creature assessed his reality. The peach beings were closing in, only 20 meters or so away now. Creature scrambled to his feet and convinced his arms to drag himself forward. He can't stay still or they will have him, he knew. In the distance, Creature spied a cave similar to his, but with a massive opening. From here, it looked to be 20 times the size and went on as far as he could see. He moved, painfully galloped towards this cave until he felt more fire on his back. The closer he got to the cave, the more the beings wanted to prevent him. The only thing he could do was put one arm in front of the other and keep going. Just inches from the opening, Creature heard groans from the hundreds of hybrids trapped in the walls. If he went back for them, he could never escape. Creature made his choice to leave them, and it hurt him far more than the fire in his back ever would. Miraculously, Creature sprinted into the opening of his escape as fast as his weak legs could carry him. He shuttled down a long, narrow, rock-walled passageway, almost exactly like the one he had chased the Madaron through. He could hear the others behind him growing fainter and fainter. Straight ahead, he saw flickering sunlight. Creature began to run, hoping with all of his heart that this is the way out. The light shone brighter and brighter. At the light source was a large metal, somewhat transparent barrier. This is it, Creature said as he twisted the round knob on it. Instantly, he was so overwhelmed with light that he was blinded. It was both beautiful and painful. He had never felt this before. Cold. So much colder than he had ever been. His skin felt the burning from the fire sticks, but everywhere, all at once. The temperature flickered, causing coldness to lick his skin in waves. All of the warmth he once had was leaving him quickly. Creature finally managed a deep breath, and it helped his vision come back into focus. He stammered forward in complete awe. In front of him stood infinite amounts of trees taller than he had ever laid eyes on, covered in beautiful white frozen crystals. With each breath, he could not believe the air. It was fresh, 
beyond his comprehension. Creature instantly forgot about the pain in his body and the beings chasing him. He ran forward into this new world with a giant smile on his face. His feet were soaked in liquid, but his heart was full. Creature dashed and played in this beautifully frozen paradise until his body was soaked to the core. It didn't take long for him to lose all feeling in his feet. His hands followed soon after. Then his arms, and then his legs. He fell to the ground with a thunderous roar. He landed face down on the flaky, frozen water, and below the surface, it looked like this was once a luscious river. Here again, he saw the vision of the beautiful creature in his cave. Her radiant smile allowed calmness to wash over his nearly lifeless body. Creature managed to flip onto his back so that he could stare into the bright grey sky in amazement. White dots fell and sprinkled his numb face. At the very edge of his vision, he recognised a Madarn perched on a rock, silently watching Creature as his life left his body. He turned his head to take comfort in the Madarn's presence, and Creature finally understood. Yes, he was dying, but after all this time, he was free. Creature's eyes suddenly shone brighter than they ever had. Two spotlights piercing the grey skies as far as his sight would reach. The Madon stood sentry while Creature's eyes faded to black.
The man regards the child who managed to survive the escape with him. Her eyes are barren and her skin grows colder every second. He hopes he has been a comfort to her all those years in that cage. He cherishes the fact that she can no longer be so afraid. The child had always loved the man's tales of mystical lands and Creature's story had been their last together. He knew the cold was taking him too, slowly, but he can find no fear there. He had watched the child's eyes dim and die, and he feels his glow slipping too. He feels the gaze of his captors, even out here, and he is glad they are still watching. All those years locked away, he wondered what was waiting outside. How far could they get if they ran? Living conditions are impossible outside the walls, he knew that. But these minutes outside of his cage proved that the world is still a beautiful place. A harsh one, but far kinder than the one inside those walls. He understands why he risked his life and lost the child. Out here, in the frozen, real world. He is no longer flesh in a cell, waiting to become someone else's food. His death had always been inevitable, but now it is on his terms. Cold. Numb. Nothingness. Just cold. No more pain. No more fear. The air. The breeze. The peace. And just as the eyes of his child had gone black, so did his. You have just listened to The Giant, written and scored by Connor, edited by Mary McFarland, narrated by Maeve O'Sullivan. <laughs>